So welcome back, everybody, to the Victor Frankel Meaning Academy. In the Meaning Academy podcast, I am here in my virtual studio with my colleague, good friend, and brother, Dr. Daniel A. Franz. How you doing, buddy? I am outstanding. You know, it's it's early on a Friday morning when we record this. I look forward to this time with you every week, and uh, I know other people do, too. And so, yeah, it's been a meaningful morning for me. Got a nice... Uh, Nice little trot in while chatting with a good friend uh, uh, in, in Texas I haven't chat, uh, talked to in a while. So getting some chores done and just a, a nice day ahead, right? A busy day, a working day, but a good day. How about you, man? Yeah, no, sa- same thing. I'm wrapping up a very meaningful and meaning filled week. Um, one of the things that we did together, as you know, this week, sharing with our listeners is we did our second um your search for meaning online gathering we gather together as meaning seekers it's open to anybody and everybody you just have to find your way into the meaning academy and you can then register um and try out the first one for free on the uh, meaningacademy.com you'll see everything there so we had a very meaningful conversation this was a very touching I don't know, heart opening kind of a conversation with maybe six, seven, eight others. And maybe that's a good jumping off point for us today to talk about what we experienced there. Yeah, I, I absolutely think so. Um, you know, I, I'll be, you know, if we're going to be honest and share today, I, I was not looking forward to that. I mean, of course, I always look forward to it, right? Time with you, time with the good Dr. Elise and our, our, our tribe of meaning seekers, amazing people, such amazing people. Um, but you know, I had just come off and I was, I warned both you guys, man, it, it, that day was insane. Like literally I had, I think I had eight clients scheduled back to back to back with a little break. And then there was a crisis that happened. I had to fill that in. And, you know, it was one of those days that maybe I got a chance to uh, use the restroom and, and put some calories in my body on a couple of occasions. But, and then right after the last one, I zipped home for our meeting and got online. And as always, it was spectacular, meaningful, heartwarming, sharing, connecting. Um, damn, it was powerful. Powerful. There we go. That's the word. Well, it's you know, it's also interesting. I mean, it's not like you ran off after everything you just said and to go, you know, take your pickleball class or whatever you people do in Indiana. But uh, ironically, uh, apparently, Bremen, Indiana, might be the new pickleball capital of the world. <laughs> so I know my people. Um, <laughs> And but it's not like you ran off to pickleball class. You ran off to a conversation about what Dr. Victor Frankel calls the tragic triad. How do you handle, you know, the tragic triad, I think, is really a placeholder for the big stuff in life that sucks, right? That hurts. That's difficult that you can't change the outcome. He says the tragic triad, as you know, you taught the course is um, pain, guilt, and suffering. But again, I think those are more categories than they are sort of um, pain points. And we can get into what they are, but you went right into a deep and heartfelt discussion on the tragic triad. Yeah. Um, well, and sorry, not to correct you, but to correct you, um, pain and suffering are the same thing in the tragic triad. It's pain, guilt, and the big one, the one we you know, can't escape death. from, right? We all have to face death. And I bring that up because actually the, the good friend in Texas, I was just talking, uh, just lost his father a, a few weeks ago. And so we were talking about death and, and the meaning behind it and all of that kind of, all the self-transcendent things we talk about anyway. So yeah, um, our, our topic for month one in the curriculum was, you know, am I a victim or a victor, right? Uh, when life comes at me, when pain, guilt, and death come at me, as we teach, as the good doctor taught us, we have a choice to make. How do we want to relate to those difficulties in life all of us will face? And we get to choose. We can choose to be a victim and let us cr- let, let those circumstances crush us, or we get to choose to learn from it. Dr. Frankel gives us the, the opponents, the opposite Um, the, the order to the chaos of the tragic triad is tragic optimism where he teaches us, we can take that pain and make it achievement. We can look at that guilt and learn how to change our behavior from it. And we can accept death and recognize that the transitoriness of life means that it's short and sweet. And we got to do something amazing with it. 
And that's a lot of what we talked about Wednesday night. Yeah, it's um, it's a very important conversation to have. I just for our listeners, you know, even if you missed the first month, you didn't miss anything because the content is there. The curriculum's always there. It's evergreen. The discussions are recorded and each session stands alone. So although it does build, you know, very methodically, you can jump in at any point. That's how we designed it. So that if you're listening to this and you want to be a part of the next conversation, which just is a continuation, jump right on in. So back to the, let me, let me jump in B because yeah. I was, I was reminded by Dr. Lease when, when we ended last week, the one she is hosting starting next month, our first meeting, the first Wednesday of the month at noon Eastern is, is more about coming into the self. And uh, what did she say? Marinating in the self, really paying attention to our, our needs. I forget the actual title, but it, because the way she said that just hit me so hard. Um, so some great <laughs> stuff coming up next week, or next month. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward title. It's, who am I? Right. And it's not just navel gazing exercise, you know, like that's fun and part of it, but it's to really um, kind of drill down into um, our why, you know, that's what we're moving towards. As Dr. Frankel says, if you know your why, you can endure your how. What's my what's my core essence, my purpose, my nuos, my spirit. And so we're going to go deep, but it's also going to be practical. Um, and, and again, back to, though, this conversation I think we started there because we wanted to um, remind people that we're all facing our personal concentration camps, as Viktor Frankl called it. You know, people read his book oftentimes, and it, it sets such a high bar when you speak of things like the Holocaust, mm -hmm. right? Like the ultimate supreme darkness that most of us are never going to experience in that exact way. But one of the things Dr. Frankl reminds us is, your pain, your guilt, or your death is your suffering. And your suffering is yours and yours alone. And it can turn into an inner concentration camp, he calls it. And so we have to learn our, our how to deal with that concentration camp. Yeah. And we had a, a one of our uh, first meeting seekers to kind of jump in on, and share on that was a uh, former law enforcement struggling with some of his brothers and sisters, uh, uh, there, he had reported that there had been actual murders of some of his um, law enforcement brothers and sisters where he had lived, and he was struggling with that, and other people were, and he was trying to figure out what he could do to help them. And in in, in the seriousness of that conversation, as you and I do, um, B, I you know I thought we, we were going to come to virtual blows there because we are on opposite ends of the meaning spectrum. Um, my suggestion to engage, to do things of a self-transcendent nature, to try to be helpful as our law enforcement of officers typically are, they are the heroes, hope most of them, um, and want to help. And that was my guidance, you know, find ways to do and self-transcend. And then you come in with the sucker punch left and you're like, no, 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 let's go this way. You want to share? And and, and I love you and I respect you. I just and I thought it was beautiful how you and I could come in on opposite ends of the spectrum and both of them applied. Well, I do think, you know, partially what you and I are committed to is truth with a capital T and many small T's, many small truths. How do you get there? How many pathways? You know, there's many pathways to the one. And so challenging, you know, our assumptions, you challenge me all the time. Um, you know, every time you wear that cardigan, I'm just like questioning oh, God, it today, man. Who, who am I and why am I here? Um, <laughs> That's next month's curriculum. Who am I? <laughs> but no, but I think it's it's also you and I both want to model in our community mm -hmm. that we're creating that there is no one way. Victor Frankl's way was Victor Frankl's way and your way is your way. My way is my way. And what we have to do is support each other on our journey to our capital T truth. And so, you know, in that conversation, you talked about a path into that meaning. And I talked about what I saw as sort of the opposite path, which is not doing, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, and I, of course, agree, there is a time and place to do something. But as a teacher of mine, Sylvia Borstein wrote a book called, don't just do something, sit there, mm -hmm. right? Don't just do something, sit there. And in our culture, that's almost revolutionary it's a revolutionary act to not do something sometimes. Definitely counterintuitive. 
um, to to what we're used to doing. And ironic, uh, a diff I just learned in an exchange with a different uh, meaning seeker student of ours, um, you want to throw out the teachers you studied under. One of our students got to study under Joseph Campbell himself. We wow. were talking about um, some union studies. And uh, he said, hey, have you read the, the Jung, portable Jung book edited by Joseph Campbell? I'm like, ah, it's like literally right up there. No, actually, I moved it here to actually get back to reading it. And he goes, yeah, I studied with Campbell. I'm like, you what? So those of you who don't know, Joseph Campbell's like in the past 100 years illustrated the hero's journey and all that. That B and I talk about all the time. But to the point, you know, this, this I would I would really call it a, a spectrum of opportunity and choice when it comes to uh, discerning meaningful decisions in times of difficulty, pain, guilt, and death of choosing to do or not do. And sometimes that can be some of our most difficult but most meaningful decisions in life. Do we act? Do we do something? Or do we step back and, and wait and see what the nuos, what the spirit has to bring to us? And that's why there's no one path. There's your path mm -hmm. to your meaning. And one of the reasons why I teach the Enneagram is because it gives a blueprint for nine different sort of survival tactics. And I got to defy my number. I got to defy my, my natural direction. So as an eight, and I do think you're mostly eight as well, but it's my, my natural inclination is do something. And so I tend to overdo um, in those situations when I'm experiencing pain or guilt or I don't know, death, but contemplating, you know, all that comes with death, I, I tend to overcompensate and overdo, but I have clients and loved ones who underdo, mm -hmm. right? So it's about learning who you are, which that's, that's why people got to show up next month, right? Who am I? Mm -hmm. um, but we're grappling with how do I stop reacting and start to respond in the words of Frankel, become response able, able to choose my response to that particular set of suffering. Absolutely. And that's the reason why I teach the Myers-Briggs type indicator or the MBTI, because it actually offers 16 different ways to act, <laughs> seven more than the Enneagram. Oh, wait, there's more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, and, and as an extrovert, um, you know, that's that's my nature to process externally, to get out there and do and, and frequently do. And I have to, you know, as you said, defy my letters from time to time and go against that type to sit peacefully and, and meditate or pray and hope and wait. And admittedly from, through my entire life, not a strength of mine, patience, but one I am often called and tested to, uh, to deal with. And then our, um, co our colleague, Dr. Elise, she is much more of a feeler you know, I, I think it's safe to say that you and I go more into action or doing or maybe, you know, for you thinking. Um, but Dr. Elise clearly goes into an emotive kind of a place. You could feel it on the on the call. Like she's the first to sort of lend a, an emotional Band-Aid to somebody who's bleeding. Whereas, you know, like I'm looking at it going, oh, isn't the human you know, psyche, interesting. Look how it bleeds, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. Like, gee, I wonder what we do about that blood. I mean, does it fit with our agenda or the curriculum right yeah, now? Yeah, like how long can somebody last, you know, while emotionally <laughs> bleeding and not... Bleeding how out? can I tie into this what I meant to be teaching and why is it detracting from what my agenda was? And um, and Elise gotta, comes in, and you're right, man. She was the emotional band aid so many times that she felt the need to come back the next morning and text us like it was beautiful, guys. Just want to make sure I didn't overstep my bounds in attending to people's emotional needs. And, and like everybody has their place, and like I'm willing to carry you off the battlefield, you know, like with every ounce of my being. I'm just I got to defy my number or my reaction, which is sort of to avoid the emotions. Right. Yeah. I, there's a piece of me that feels out of control when I get into that emotional realm. So my work is around pain and guilt. And I have a hard time with death because it's so abstract, but, you know, mm -hmm. suffering. Um, I've got to find ways to like like Elise said, I got to find ways to um, marinate in the emotional side of things a little longer. And that's yeah. I'm just sharing. It's very hard for me. OK, B.
let's let's do this then. Let's do a little activity as we asked our meeting seekers to do. At the end of the session, you know, I said, hey, look, if there's something you want to be held accountable to, you know, a either an action you need to take or or peace you need to find, liminal space you need to embrace, you know, let's come to the community, put it up in there. And we're here to help you. We're here to help each other, right? That's why it's a community. It's not just about the three of us teaching, um, but we want to support each other and draw in uh, the support of those that work with us. And so, so I, I didn't want to issue that challenge and then not partake as well, right? As, as a teacher, I'm also a student. And so I jumped in there and shared a little bit about where I need some accountability to find liminal space. But, you know, I, I and I will certainly share today, but I'm going to ask you to, because I know you're struggling with some emotions that are going unexpressed. So mm -hmm. where do you need to either, you know, let's, we can demonstrate to our listeners now, sure. right? Go against your, your defy your number B and where do you need to deal with some of this? Well, I'll deal with a different one than I put into the community. I'm happy to, you know, talk about that one in the community, but that one's a little politically charged and I just don't really want to get into it, but I will take a different route and I'll go with, you know, I have four kids. Um, we have four kids and not Dan and I just, I was, <laughs> yes, faithful listener, not the two of us, but, um, we have four, Ariel and I have four kids and they are in the heating up stages of life. You know, the, mm -hmm. my youngest just is turning 13. My second youngest just turned 16 today. So you can imagine a lot of a charged emotion and energy and intensity in the house. I literally came over to the studio from my house to um, leaving behind, I think, 10 girls who were there to kidnap my daughter and take her out to breakfast. 10, 16 year old girls. So a lot of a lot of hormones pumping in that house right now. And then my um, my my oldest daughter is 18 and my oldest child, my son, is 21. So these are really like. Big, bigger kid problems than I've certainly ever had to deal with as a parent. And every day it's chaos. Like every day there's another drama or emotional happening. And one of the things that I've noticed for now 24 years married to Ariella is if I'm not careful, I'll outsource emotional department to her and I'll be CEO of the fixing department. Right. And I'll come in and I'll fix. I'll bring my toolbox and I'll diagnose and I'll fix. And I lose something in that of a connection with her as a co-parent, with my kids as a more holistic approach to parenting, and but with myself. And that's what I want to talk about because I find myself feeling far more competent in fixing which I think is why I gravitated towards being a logo therapist. Not that we're not that our job is to fix, but sometimes it's easier to be a participant in somebody else's challenges than my own and um, finding myself when it comes to myself or my family, not dealing or dwelling in the emotion. And that's a, that's a challenging starting point for me. Yeah. To, to your point, I think that's what draws us to that sometimes is I know in my darkest days, it's easier to go to work and help people with other, with, with their emotions, with their issues, with their needs than address my own. And, and through your part there, I, <laughs> wow, thank you. I feel as though you may have called me out in my lack of dealing with my own emotions recently, because I, I will share about what I put in the community. And if you want to participate, hop on over to the Meeting Academy and join your search for meaning. Um, so for me, again, I issued this challenge to our group and I figured, you know what, um, can't issue a challenge without participating in it. And so in my life right now, you know, many of you listeners heard a few weeks ago, I just kind of offered a, a, a brief um, statement that my wife's struggling with some health issues. So I'll give you a little bit more with her permission. And I don't say this to ask for, for sympathy or any, you know, it's just how I'm dealing with it and, and really to demonstrate. Um, so I knew coming into this relationship uh, when we were dating, she told me that she had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 16. Um, MS is a disease, a chronic disease that attacks the uh, protective uh, sheath, the myelin sheath around the nervous system at random times and at random points. We don't understand much about it. We know certain things in life can exacerbate it, stress, um, you know, diet, so many things, right? We're doing a lot of great research in the field. 
but she's currently, you know, we've been blessed, you know, since I've known her, um, you know, we've had two children. Um, we've done amazing things together, seen amazing sights, and have been very fortunate that she has not suffered very many um, MS-related attacks. Until uh, it was just a few years ago, she had quite a debilitating one. And it was interesting. We think this may have been precipitated by a bit of a knee surgery. Something in that may have brought up some symptoms. And, uh, you know, she was laid up. It was around spring break. She was a teacher at that time. And pretty much uh had to take much of the remainder of the school year off or went back intermittently and we got through that with a lot of help from friends and prayers and support um, and now recently in the past few weeks uh, we believe she is struggling from another attack where she is uh, she's in a new job now which is fortunate she doesn't have to go and teach every day she gets to work from home and when she does leave she goes for a couple hours to do a training and, and loves it, really enjoys it. So that's definitely uplifting to her. Unfortunately, she does not have full use of, of, of her hands right now. And uh, it's become, well, I mean, we, we find ways around it. I get to be her right and left hand very often. I'll pour her coffee or fill her water jug. And, uh, you know, she is sensitive to when uh, I can do that because right now she may need a cup of water and I'm on the recording with B and I can't go up there and unscrew her Yeti. Um, it's little things like that throughout the day that um, can be, I mean, if I let them, they could truly be an annoyance. But in the, in the you know, uh, as, being a therapist and a logo therapist, like I do force myself to find meaning in this and to be like, you know, Hey, maybe the difficulties we've had in the past are nothing, as all couples do, that here I get to share in this journey with you and, and be your hands where you um, can't. And But going to the point of, you know, I, I am a person to find solutions as an Enneagram 8, as an ENTJ. I think, I act, I plan, I do. Um, and too often, that means I'm too busy doing um, and not busy enough taking care of my emotions or even expressing them. And that, as we know, as therapists and logo therapists, will certainly take an unhealthy toll at some point. Well, that's beautiful. First of all, thank you for sharing. It's beautiful. Um, and second of all, I see your response or your initial response in our your search for meaning discussion the other night was to do something, self-transcend, right? Coming and I can imagine it comes from this, you know, real life experience in mm -hmm. many ways, not just your wiring of watching your wife not being able to open her Yeti, you know, bottle and wanting to transcend yourself and, and give to her, help her, right? Help try to eliminate or alleviate some of that suffering. Um, but, but at the same time, right? And that's, I guess, where I come in is I know you're wired like me. And it's a slippery slope because I find myself like with my kids, back to my example, I'm right. Like I'm just right in solving their problems, but I've just sort of bypassed something important in the, in the process. Yeah. And I have absolutely, absolutely been known to do that, not just with myself, but for my wife as well. When look, I mean, obviously, if you can imagine not being able to use your hands for an extended period of time, um, there are a lot of emotions that come up with that. And when, you know, I deal with other people's emotions for eight or nine hours a day, coming home to help her with hers may not be a strength of mine. And often I find myself wanting to solve rather than maybe validate or connect or emote or empathize. And well, that's not what she needs. Sometimes she just needs a partner that can be there, uh, uh, bear witness to those emotions and be present with them. Yes. And also what I hear in that for both of us, but you know, I'm addressing what you just said is um, your orientation, eight, Enneagram 8 as an example, orientation is other. It doesn't mean we're selfless. It just means I put my attention, I'm a hunter. I put it on something outside of me and I'll just do it until it's beyond done, which is a problem unto itself. And so what I'm doing, though, is I'm taking energy away from me. Mm -hmm. So I because I then don't have to deal with how am I feeling in this? And I heard you say that in there is what is Michelle going through emotionally? 
and not what is Dan going through emotionally when he, when his wife can't use her hands. That brings up a lot of stuff. Yeah, and I have certainly been accused of that uh, by, I have wonderful office mates along with you, B, and our friend, The Running Man, that uh, have called me out on that many times in my life. Uh, several years ago when I when I lost my mother, it was, it, when I was able to joke, that my, my fellow therapist in the office were like, yeah, we knew something was wrong when you actually started talking. <laughs> And sharing, I'm like, okay, that's not funny, but it's true, right? Again, that is part of the orientation. Uh, you know, whether it's a little too much stoicism or just not enough self care or whatever it might be. Um, and, and so that was my request in our community is like, hey, man, I need some accountability to actually go and, you know, have somebody to talk to. As I said, even therapists have therapists, and I've been remiss in not having one for quite a while. So there's uh, something that's saying about, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but something about there's motion and there's emotion. And sometimes you can't be in both at the same time. You know, we go through motion in our world, some ways, to, you know, to do and not to feel. And I think what, um, what Dr. Elise was talking about when she says marinating in it, I don't do so well, mm -hmm. which is, can I just sit still? And Ariella says this to me all the time, it sounds like, 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 so obvious and it still sticks with me is feel your feelings. I'm like, wait a minute. You mean I can feel my feelings? Like not just like do my feelings or think of my feelings or fix my feelings, but just feel them. Mm -hmm. It's like such a paradigm shift for me. And I can't even explain why that is. I think you get it. And so in that situation, like when, when my daughter is going through a crisis in college right now, can I just sit and feel well, the suffering in that case, or the negative emotion that's coming up and just sit in it as an act of meaning seeking. Yeah. I love how you frame that as a paradigm shift, because as soon as I heard that, my response was no, uh, not shifting paradigms. I got stuff to do, B. I got to go. I got to knock things out. I got to open up Yetis. I got to take care of, you know, things that weren't taken. Like, no, I got stuff to do. And, and I've, you know, I've totally picked that up as as this has occurred in the past few weeks um you know my schedule has been extra booked because i'm doing and working more and my time at home like literally i've caught myself flying around the house taking care taking care doing picking things up um so that she doesn't feel that burden and then there are times i'm like all right you, you got and i've literally this is i'm embarrassed to admit this um i can think of two occasions in the past week where i said you know right now i don't have time for that and i caught myself way too late going oh you're doing it right doing it rather than feeling it and you know i'm avoiding it that's why i need to stop doing that you're in motion right not mm -hmm. emotion and i ain't got time for emotion b yeah i know I, that's I, that's part of my defense mechanism when i'm dealing with this because i tell myself i don't got time i tell myself you know it's a, there's a savior complex there just is and like i i can save i can fix it and <laughs> what i've been really trying to work on i think also it's partly partially the gift of midlife and onwards the afternoon of life especially as a man i, I can feel you know that testosterone's dropping the intensity's dropping the ability to just power through things is dissipating. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I do believe that's a gift from the universe, from nature, making us slow down and start to, well, as, as Dr. Lee says, stew in it. Stew in it. Yeah, absolutely. It's that savior complex. You, you made me chuckle when I hear that. I think of one of my favorite lines from the canadian comedy show letter kenny somebody was speaking in the main character and i can't remember whining about something maybe um had a bit of a savior complex and the main character looks up and says oh geez get off the cross we need the wood <laughs> <laughs> right and, when, and, and i need to be reminded of that when when you know i get up there on that cross and uh you know and, and again whether it's doing or self-care or just marinating as the good dr lee says and that is working you know defying our numbers working against our mbti letters shifting flexing um doing a little bit not doing being a little bit better emoting a little bit better wayne dyer talks about um you know what is the ego and he says look here's the ego 
nine months you're in the womb and everything is fine. Like the world works without you and there's nothing to do and you're taken care of and you're provided for and you're just sitting in it. And then you come out and you basically say, you know, thank you for the past nine months, God. I'll take over from here. <laughs> right. And he talks about like the rest of our life is ego edging God out, E-G-O. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that there's this like defense mechanism of I, I, I that we edge of God, but we edge out the meaning, the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so for me, anyways, as I'm talking it through with you, it's about sort of using the tragic triad of pain, guilt and suffering or death as an opportunity to realize like there are just things that are those are beyond my control. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I can keep edging God out. I can keep edging meaning out or I can just stop and like go back into that. Here I am. Mm -hmm. And OK, so maybe I, I, you know, one thing I have been doing there is trying to get closer to God or just get closer to the universe and, you know, find some acceptance. I'm just spending some time each morning, medit not doing right, praying, meditating, just sitting with the dog and and realizing like there is something at work here that I have no control over and I need to be accepting. And that's where that going back, you know, our spectrum of doing, engaging in self trans transcendent work and, and marinating, waiting, sitting in liminal space, um, you know, has to come to some kind of balance. And, you know, returning to Michelle and returning to my kids, those are opportunities. Now, I, I would never say this in a way that you know comes across wrong. I don't say bad things happen to good people so that I can learn a lesson. What I do believe is it's reality. It's what's presented. And either it's meaningless or it's meaningful. And I choose to go into it and find meaning. So if it's meaningful, thank you. I don't mm -hmm. wish it upon anybody. But as long as it's here, it's my teacher. Thank you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I want to go back to that is exactly the reason why we discussed sharing this today is so that other people, not that you can should feel sympathy or even if you'd like to share empathy, that's great. But it really is an opportunity for you to look at somebody else's situation at my situation and say, OK, what can I learn from this? You know, B and I talked about both of our families and how we operate and how we fail to operate within them sometimes so that you are faithful listener can take something from it. And I certainly hope you do. So I'll end with this. Um, in my men's groups that I run, we have a very strict rule, which is you don't tell people, you don't fix people, you don't tell them what to do, but you do experience share. You share your experience as a way to show, you know, commonality and empathy and um, give people, you know, your experience as, as, a, as a gift. But I think we should coin the term meaning shares, right? And we start bringing meaning shares into these conversations. I think that's what we've been doing today and into our Your Search for Meaning conversations. So thank you for the meaning share. Absolutely. Thank you for forcefully pushing me into it where I may not have normally done it. That's I appreciate and love you for that, my friend. Thank you. Um, and, and for those of you, as I heard you saying, I'm like, you know, there may be those of you out there that want to engage in this kind of work, you know, B and I are always open to it. I'll be honest. I, I cannot take on many more individual clients right now, but um, I know B is open to it sometimes. And we have the Meaning Academy and your search for meaning where you get to work with us. I mean, we are literally interacting with the, the tribe on a daily basis through the community. And every other week we have our meetings. Um, be, be, your men's groups are live right now, right? So you have to live in the greater Denver area to make that happen, correct? Um, that is true, although we're rolling out a virtual beta. So that'll be happening soon. So if you're a man seeking meaning and you're in the midlife and onwards, called the afternoon of life, we'd love to have you as part of that. But I think the, the easiest stepping stone into both of our worlds is to just join the Meaning Academy. You know, right now it's uh, $49 a month um, and that entitles you to our curriculum. We have a very robust multimedia curriculum with videos and workbooks and a growing inventory of what I call tools um, there for you. Plus 
a virtual community called the Meaning Seekers Community, where, as Dan mentioned, we're um, bantering and sharing and you know just going back and forth daily. And then, of course, twice a month, we have the gathering for your search for meaning. Yeah. And I want to share, and I think I pointed this out before, I love what we chose to do with the community rather than going with um, you know, what everybody else is doing and having just one more Facebook page to go to while you're inundated with, you know, advertisements for hair gel, not us, obviously, but and other things you don't really need. Um, we went with the platform where we're hosting the, the Meaning Academy, the Think Epic platform, which has its own app, its own website. So you go in there and you're not bombarded with ads for hair growth formulas, which we do need. Because that caused suffering for you and I. <laughs> <laughs> I. But it also brings about acceptance and new razor blades. But no, it has its own app where you get to hop in there and it's just us, right? So you choose, like, I am going to go into the Meaning Academy and I'm going to interact and it's not a bunch of other nonsense. And that's what I really love about that. And that it's, you know, we have two sort of pillars underneath there. One is content and one is community. So mm -hmm. you can jump back and forth. I like that too, where you check out the content, you jump back over to the community. There's just this seamless nature to it. It's really nice. And you're right. It feels a lot less distracting. Yeah, that's, there we go. A lot less distracting. So, and you know, we're, we're still young in it. I, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen people have joined so far. Get in on the front end of this because you know, you know, people need this and it's going to be growing and we love doing it and we're going to keep doing it. So hop on now before it gets too big or prices change or we change the format because, you know, surely that'll have to happen soon. But get in and see what the early stage of it are like and interact with BNI directly. And most importantly, our the lovely Dr. Elise, you know, we can give you plans and ideas and talk to you about what to do. And Dr. Elise will talk to you about your emotions and how to deal with those and actually tenderly care for them. I was going to say, if you, if you need to be carried off the battlefield, I'm your guy. But if you want to be nurtured on the battlefield, clearly <laughs> she's your uh, she's your gal. So amazing human being. Um, jump over to the meaningacademy.com where you can go to uh, you find all of the, what we're doing, but primarily your search for meaning right there. So want more? Jump over there. And until the next time, what's our sign off? Hey, live your life with meaning, purpose and resilience. Talk to you next time. Take care. Thank you.